Welcome to Cross Politic. We're about to go live with a live show today, and we have a sneak preview, sneak access to exclusive Pub TV content. Pub TV is our club member content. And so while you wait for the live show to begin, check out this content. And if you haven't yet joined the club, join the club today at crosspolitik.com. Um, at the rally in North Dakota, uh, I argued that Christians need to start taking over the institutions of cultural leadership. Um, I, or, I argued sort of broadly that we need to take over these institutions. But today I want to continue to advance that claim by arguing that in particular, Christians need to build and run the colleges and universities of America, that we need to be in charge of these. Uh, as the late bluesman Dr. John once so eloquently put it, uh, your education ain't no better than what you understand. Uh, unfortunately, despite a great deal of educating, it is highly debatable whether or, or not our colleges are producing any understanding. Uh, by this, I do not mean to make the sort of critique that a salty blue collar laborer might make about the new college boy who's just come onto the job, someone who might be full of head learning but lacking in the practical experiences of life. This old animosity is just the natural tension between youth and experience, between knowledge and wisdom. A great education is like the wineskin that Jesus talked about, young, fresh, new, but it will age and the age will improve it. I'm pointing at something different that has been occurring on our college campuses for decades. It's not that our college courses are too theoretical and not practical, it's that our college courses have increasingly turned soft. They have ceased to demand serious intellectual effort and have instead uh, made education into a curious blend of vacuous box ticking exercises and a demand for ideological conformity. In their 2011 book entitled Academically Adrift, sociologists Rick Arum and Josipa Roxa gave a, a fairly grim survey of the present state of American colleges and universities. One of their most striking observations was that 45% of college students see no progress in critical thinking, complex reasoning, and writing skills over the course of their freshman and sophomore years. I'd point out this was in 2011. I think that number would be substantially higher now. Uh, I would argue that this is largely because the first two years of college are essentially remedial, teaching students what they should have learned in their high schools. Only 38% of 2018 ACT test takers scored high enough to be considered prepared for college level coursework, while 69.1 of them still went on to college, about twice that number. Uh, so those first two years necessarily must be significantly dumbed down while half the class either catches up or drops out. Incidentally, I think this is why it's increasingly common for high school students to use dual enrollment and other strategies to allow them to skip the first two years of college. Uh, those first two years are increasingly just remedial. Nevertheless, our colleges have unfortunately adjusted to accommodate our nation's lower and lower expectations for education. A room in rocks I describe what a, a current college student in America can hope for. They might graduate, but they are failing to develop the higher order cognitive skills that is widely assumed college students should master. These findings are sobering and should be a cause for concern. Here's, very, here's one very startling piece of data that offers a peek into how colleges have adjusted their expectations downward for students over the past six decades. A full-time college student in 1961 dedicated 40 hours per week to attending classes and studying for those classes. The general logic was that pursuing a college education should take the same amount of effort that one would need to give to a full-time job, 40 hours a week. However, this number has steadily declined ever since that year. In fact, the typical college student surveyed from 2011 to 2015 committed three and a half hours per, week, or per weekday to both attending classes and studying. In case your math is not that great, that means that the typical college student in the last decade spent 17.5 hours per week pursuing their education. Remember that this includes both attending class as well as the necessary studying that it takes to be ready for class. Assuming that they were taking the standard minimum of, of 12 credits for full-time status, then at least 12 of those 17 and a half hours would have been spent uh, attending the actual class. That means that they're putting in at most about five and a half hours per week studying. When their 1960s ancestors were studying 28 hours, 
Or put another way, the 1960s college class required more than five times as much studying to prepare for than the current typical college class. Now that is shocking. Uh, it may be that our uh, expanded class campus amenities are distracting from rather than enhancing the actual mission of the college. And yet, even though the hours committed to studying have gone down, the grades of today's college students have climbed steadily higher and higher. In 1960, approximately 15% of college students received A's, while 35% of them received C's. But since the year 1960, A's have become more and more common, while C's, D's, and F's have become rarer. American colleges have experienced six decades of severe grade inflation, like the Little League game where no score is kept and everyone is declared a winner in order to protect their supposedly fragile egos, our current college classes give out A's like participation ribbons. In 1998, the A became the most frequently awarded grade in American college classes. And in our present day, a full 45% of all grades are A's. So even though current college students study less than one fifth of the time that their 1960s ancestors studied, they are a full three times more likely to get an A. Either we have just managed to raise the most gifted and amazing generation of wonderkinder that the world has ever seen, and I think this is, more, or I think it's a bit more likely, colleges have gotten easier and easier. Our grade um, inflation indicates an education deflation. Consider again that critique from uh, the book Academically Adrift. The authors did not just argue that the college is getting generally easier. It's not simply that students do not study as long as they used to or have to do as many homework problems as they used to. The lowering of the standards is connected to a change in the kind of education that is being given. Graduates are no longer challenged to develop the higher order cognitive skills. So this weakening of the standard results in a changed quality of the education, not just quantity. There's a kind of thinking that is not being passed on by our colleges because the education that they provide no longer requires it. I would argue that the shift in this kind of education that colleges uh, give is a direct result of a shift over the past century in our understanding of the purpose or ultimate goal of education. In short, we have lost our way with regard to the why of education and the resulting confusion has had deleterious effects on the quality of our schools. Here's what I mean. If you ask any college student on a campus today the simple question, what is the purpose of your college education? The almost certain answer that you will get will be so I can get a job. In America, the widely understood purpose of a college education, and increasingly the purpose of all education, is to give you certain qualifying skills specific to a particular career path. Put another way, we, th we now think of education simply as vocational certification, that piece of paper that gets you a job. But this was not always the case. To understand how we got to where we are, we need to backtrack a little more than a century. When the land-grant universities were first founded by the Morrill Acts, 1862 and 1890, they were established in order to promote a new branch of study, a branch of study made up of what were then referred to as the useful arts, namely the more utilitarian and technical studies of engineering and agriculture. At the time, these were the disciplines necessary to build the infrastructure of a young nation going through a tremendous growth spurt. The land-grant universities supplied the leadership and vision for the United States leap in engineering and agriculture at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th centuries. But once one has granted the category of useful arts, it is difficult to avoid the obvious inference that the other subjects must be the useless arts. When the term useful arts was first coined, the intent was to distinguish technical training from the traditional liberal arts. Thus, over the past century, as the useful arts have flourished on our college campuses, we have also seen the long, slow demise of the classical liberal arts, the study of literature, philosophy, history, etc. As these useless arts have become slowly overshadowed by the more clearly vocationally oriented majors. The American church really is gay. Are you asking me out on a date? Effeminate. The Bible appears more to whisper when it comes to sexual sin. Shallow. I said, I want the African American seven. And full of cowardly leaders. Are we going to keep bickering over secondary issues? America desperately needs to return to the Father. Either we fall on the rock and are broken, or we fall on the ground and are crushed under that rock. To fall on top of the rock and be broken is exactly the condition in which God brings Reformation and Revival. So which way is it, prodigal America? Are you coming home to the Father? 
Join us this Reformation Day in Fort Worth, Texas, October 31st through November 2nd at Will Rogers Event Center, just days before our presidential election. And join with the thousands of us for the blessing of gathering together with God's people and celebrating God's goodness with beer and psalms. Hear from speakers such as uh, Dr. James White, Pastor Toby Sumter, Pastor Doug Wilson, Dr. George Grant, Gabe and Knox, Steve Dace, and more. Don't forget our Business Makers Conference, Jumpy Castles for the kiddos, after parties, single events, the Pastor's Luncheon, the Business Leader's Luncheon, and many more surprises coming. America has squandered her inheritance far too long. It's time she repents and returns home to her father. Fight, Laugh, Feast presents Prodigal America. Help, Lord, your law, the godly cease to save us. Whoa, are oh, you just cracked it open? Yes, I did. Just like that. Because I need it. It's Baron Psalms. Baron Psalms. Psalms. Wednesday. It's Wednesday. Hey, y'all. Welcome to Cross Politics on the Fight Live Feast Network. This is, I'm not as good at this. No, we're not as good. Yeah. Boss. No. <laughs> uh, Toby, what's the psalm today? Psalm? You don't know this one? I, I mean, come on, man. I didn't look at the notes. Yeah, I'm you, cheating. You should know all your psalms. Ooh, this, harmony. This is Psalm 12, babe. Psalm 12. Nice. I know people are looking at my beer right now thinking, like, Knox poured that poorly. No, I did that on purpose, people. Yeah. <laughs> it's better in my glass than in my belly. You know what I'm saying? That's what I'm saying. Yes, I did that right. Actually, this, this, works, this psalm is going to work out really well because it's all about God judging lying lips. Ooh. You know, so we're lying, talking, lying history. Lie, yeah, lie, 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 <laughs> lie, lie, lie. Talking about telling the truth. We're talking about God's yeah. word is yeah. like silver tried. Oh yeah, oh yeah. There's a little, there's a little hippie ditty on that. Um, Don't say ditty. Don't, no ditty. No ditty. Yeah. Yep. There was no. There's no, there was no ditty. There was no, no ditty. ditty. No ditty. <laughs> Here. <laughs> there's no hippie ditty. Okay. Um, no we're also like six weeks out from our conference, Prodigal America, in October. Oh yeah. Yeah. Six yeah. weeks out. October thirty. We pretty much have Reformation Day. Yeah, Reformation Day. You know what else? Uh We've had three days without a presidential assassination. (laughs) Three. 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 We need an office. (laughs) Attempt. An office. uh, You know, no one's been injured in three days. Three days. We had to reset. It's been three days since the last. Reset the assassination. Dr. Dr. Dorney's like, what did I get myself into? No, he's already (laughs) regretting it. He's already (laughs) regretting it. He's like, how long is this going to be? He regretted it when we (laughs) sat him down and made him scoot all the way to the table. He started feeling claustrophobic immediately. I know. Yeah. He's like, oh. I feel claustrophobic and I'm all the way over here. I'm like, what are we doing in here? Are you concerned your child's current education won't give them the skills necessary to succeed in any area of life? Consider homeschooling with classical conversations. By applying the classical Christian model of education, the classical conversations curriculum encourages students to learn how to learn and how to think for themselves so they can adapt to every challenge life throws at them. Join over 50,000 families in 50 countries who have chosen to educate their children with Classical Conversations by visiting classicalconversations.com. And then you can just put a little slash FLF at the end of it. Let them know that we sent you. That's classicalconversations.com slash FLF. And as you can tell, we have uh, we have a guest in the studio today, Dr. Yeah. Jordan Dorney. He's, it's been a while since we had one in the studio. He's a yeah. fellow of history at New St. Andrews College. He teaches the college sophomore year history colloquium as well as electives in intellectual history and historiography. Sophomores, tough crowd, man. Uh, I mean, I, and, he, and he's competing with uh, Chris Slack too, which is you know it's oh. kind of I mean those are you know, it's, it's a big it's a big deal. But yeah. uh, uh, he, he 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 from Xenophon to Machiavelli to American founding Dr. Dorney and his wife uh, Dr. Amanda Dorney married to a doctor. Oh man. Mm-hmm. Watch out. The debates in that household. <laughs> I li- hate Churchill. I love Churchill. <laughs> <laughs> they live here in Moscow with their son and their two daughters. Uh, Jordan, thanks for joining us on Cross Politics. Yep. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Are uh, you regretting it yet? Not yet. No, 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 not yet. <laughs> All right. He, so, he we, teaches sophomores. He's, he's, we got to try harder. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hard, hard to face him. So, Gabe, what are we talking about? Yeah, we're going to be talking about uh, the, the Daryl Cooper, Tucker Carlson, um, oh yeah! Can we call it like a, a In, history lesson? No, or conversation. Not, conversation. Just a conversation. Yeah. You know, so a couple of weeks ago, Daryl Cooper, who's actually just a, a couple hours north of us okay. here in uh, Idaho, uh, was on Tucker Carlson, kind of talking about history and and there's actually I think a, a lot of good things he had to say just about how we read history, how we think about history, how we receive history. But 
what really drew a lot of ire or a lot of um, I think, excitement I, I and think conversation. Ire, I think ire is probably I, fair too. <laughs> uh, was his comments about Winston Churchill? We'll get to that here in a second. Uh, about his comments about um, you know um, some Hitler intermittent camps and stuff like that. There's a movie intermittent after, camps. Did I say intermittent? Yeah. <laughs> Look at him and, and here. They're, they're he's, down, he's downplaying it. It was he's down, downplaying already. It. Already, it was like I mean, it happened oh, and then it no. didn't. I mean, they had the camp and then they didn't. I mean, it was <laughs> no, no. You know, it's temporary and then. It, <laughs> Never mind. Gabe's they weren't so, always so, in the they, camp. Yeah, they were. They got to go outside the camp. No, stop, <laughs> stop. Uh, sorry, sir. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, and so actually, I think the first clip that I want I want to play with you guys is Daryl uh, and Tucker talking about kind of about like our political lenses that kind of create or or kind of force a historical narrative color. out of it. Color it. That's yeah. that's good. Very good. Intermittently color. <laughs> <laughs> the the narrative in it. Um, so let's let's roll the the Daryl uh, Tucker first clip. But it's one of those things that nobody wants to talk about because it doesn't fit neatly into one of our easy political. Uh, so categories. that's what bothers me about the recording of history. I mean, I, I think it what happens matters. Reality matters, and if you find that sort of everything that happens, not just eighty years ago in Dresden, but things that are happening in like LA County 20 years ago, yeah. if they just disappear, you know, in some cases you can't even find them on Google. Like that's a level of manipulation. That's like, that's just mind control. That's, that's really scary. And yeah. Dangerous. And I think the propagandists throughout the 20th century, uh, ever since the, the sort of the rise of mass media have really understood that that's exactly what it is. Okay. So history is, as propaganda or kind of your, your political yeah. lens is kind of what creates that propaganda and kind of the results that you want out of it. Now I was kind of, th I was thinking about this, like, um, you know, we're, um, there's layers to kind of the different factions that are going on with current views of history all the way down to, you know, you got your, your conservatives and liberals, the big divide on how you read history. You know, you got your DEI view of history and then you got your, I don't know, redneck view, your conservative view of history. And then you got kind of your, um, you know, Christian view of what happened in history, and and then you, you and then you got all kinds of sub sub subcategories developing under that the the post war consensus guys who think everything's just you know constantly defaulting to post war consensus of a narrative analysis. Yeah, go ahead, um, Joy. Maybe I'm wrong here because I'm trying to work through this myself. But ain't history just what happened? Well, uh, I mean, I think right. one of the things you want to do is just separate out a few things. One, there's the past, then there's history, uh, the narrative of the past, then maybe even if you want to get fancy at historiography, how you write about the narrative of the past. Um, you know, there's other ways that you could divvy it up, but some of the confusion that arises is that comes with the collapse of all of those things mm -hmm. so that uh, we're kind of eliding those distinctions and then inviting all sorts of problems. So, so that's really interesting. So, okay, so you're saying there is the past. That's just what happened. Mm -hmm. The history is the telling of the past, right? Is that how you right. say it, it? You know, let's say we had a video, a video record of uh, some event uh, that happened uh, 150 years ago, whatever. Uh, that's not history itself, right? You would still need to go through some kind of process of making judgments of weighing the evidence of doing something um and and, and so d when when you make that that first mistake when you collapse the past and history mm -hmm. um maybe a few things happen but one would be that you're not really seeing the potential for propaganda or whatever at all mm -hmm. because you think well it, it's just the account of the past what, i saw that know, video what, what would be the problem yeah, yeah. right mm -hmm. but a video can only catch a Once. certain segment yeah. of what actually happened it, it, nothing can catch everything universally exhaustively right the record is not the thing yes right yeah no, yeah exactly well this is i think i think this conversation has all sorts of implications on how we read scriptures because even in the gospel you have matthew mark and luke mm -hmm. and john who who had different angles of what happened in christ's life right and we i think there's been a massive simplification of how we read history right now both both kind of on the uh um, you know, the, the guys that don't believe um, that we landed on the moon to the... To, well, why are you looking at me? Why you, why I, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. <laughs> Do it again. Yeah. To the people who don't believe... Because you wear the tin hat. I'm just saying. I don't have an... I saw a video. To, to the people who That's all believe, I saw. Like the the man said that it's not the past, right? right? He just said watching the video ain't the past, right? <laughs> but, but the way God wrote history is far more complex. And the way God tells yeah. stories is far more complex. I mean, like, one of the, you know, uh, should I be sympathetic with Churchill, which comes up in 
in this video. In fact, let, let, let's tee up that clip actually real quick. Um, let's bring up the Churchill clip. Uh, I got in trouble with my podcast partner, Jocko Willink, one time because he's a New England Dutchman who's his family. It's near and dear to uh, their Dutch, but very near and dear to their heart that Winston Churchill is a hero, right? Well, everyone Everyone thinks Churchill. that. He really thinks that. And I told him that I think, and maybe I'm being a little, little hyperbolic, maybe, but I told him, maybe trying to provoke him a little bit, that I thought Churchill was the chief villain of the Second World War. Now, he didn't kill the most people. He didn't uh, commit the most atrocities, but I believe, and I don't really think, I think when you really get into it and tell the story right and don't leave anything out, you see that he was primarily responsible for that war, becoming what it did, becoming something other than an invasion of Poland. Mm. So, yeah, that's the thing that got everybody upset. That's, that's one of the things, but he, and, and he said he was hyperbolizing, maybe not. He said he was and trying to get at the skin they, of, yeah. his, of his co host Jocko. Yeah. But, but I think what's helpful here, what this illustrates here, is that, you know, um, if you don't read the Bible and don't have God's kind of history, God's narrative in your mind, because I mean, like most of the scripture is a history book. Right. And, you know, so should I be sympathetic historically towards Churchill? Should I be sympathetic, you know, historically towards, uh, you know, Hitler? Um, well, if you, if you aren't reading God's word, like, should you be historic, uh, you know, sympathetic towards King David? Yes, God was. King David was after a man after you know God's own heart. Did King David, you know, murder Uriah? Yeah, it was horrible. But I think you know, if we read, I think you know, we're talking about just how we simplify history, or you know, it's kind of I was, you know, always like coming up with weird phrases to describe things that everyone really? understands. That's going. Everyone understands what huh. I'm saying. It's like you know, you don't read history in like two D chess. Two D. You, you follow that? It's not two, two right? You follow that? See, you know what I'm saying? You know, <laughs> Tom is like, Doc got it. I know what he's saying. <laughs> I hate myself for knowing what he's saying. The, the audience knows. All you know, everyone understands what I'm saying. Mm. But like, history is more complicated than that. But we have to actually. I think it's uh, the the. I think for me, the big takeaway when I walked away from listening to most of this interview was, man, we really need to understand God's way and how He writes history, and how He thinks about history. Um, and, and I think that actually informs us to better understand, um, you know, how we understand, you know, you know, Churchill or even this, this interview. Yeah. You want to play one? You have one more clip? Yeah, we can, we can add, um, I'm not that, saving you from that. I saw you looking for me to save you. I'm not saving you. No, I just, no, I, just, just I just made a really good I'm point. I'm still thinking about just, 2D the, chess. That what 2D the chess heck? thing, man, is, uh, it's complicated, no. but you got it. Uh, and then here's, here's the, the last clip that we'll play, play and then get into more discussion here, but it's a kind of talking about kind of the Hitler stuff. You know, Germany, look, they they put themselves into a into a position and Adolf Hitler is chiefly responsible for this, but his whole regime is responsible for it, that when they went into the East uh, in 1941, they launched a war where they were completely unprepared to deal with the millions and millions of prisoners of war, of local political prisoners and so forth that they were going to have to handle. They went in with no plan for that. And they just threw these people into camps and millions of people ended up dead there. You know, you have, uh, you have like letters as early as July, August, 1941 from commandants of these makeshift camps that they're setting up for these millions of people who are surrendering or people they're rounding up. And they're, so it's two months after, a month or two after Barbarossa was launched. And they're writing back to the high command in Berlin saying, we can't feed these people. We don't have the food to feed these people. And one of them actually says, rather than wait for them all to slowly starve this winter, wouldn't it be more humane to just finish them off quickly now? Yeah, that's that was one of the other clips that got um, yeah, got, got people it. worked up. I mean, the... This isn't... Go ahead, pass. I, I, just, I just want to underline the obvious. I guess the, a lot of people picked up on... Um, uh, I think it sounds like, you know, millions of people ended up dead. Can, could be... Um, taken to mean the Holocaust was not on purpose. The final solution was not an intended thing. And oops, um, oops, they, we accidentally ended up with all these prisoners. We had to start the camps. R rather than <laughs> That's the, what I meant by intermittent. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> rather than having, uh, uh, you know, the, the historical records that indicate that they were rounding people up and very intentionally putting them in camps, very intentionally um, annihilating, um, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and um, carrying out genocide. Um, 
when I first heard it, I it was all set up as talking about the East, and so I was willing to give him sort of a, a maybe a benefit of the doubt. Maybe he's just talking about one section of this, um, of the, at the very beginning of the war and talking about the Eastern um, POWs. Um, but that's that's the that's one of the places where people would say, wait, 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 what in the world is he talking about, Jordan? Um, y- have you seen the whole interview or or most of it? Uh, some of it, yeah. yeah. And uh, I'm I'm just curious. I mean, there's a number of particular questions I have, but I guess I'd, I'd like to sort of zoom out first of all and just say, what are your what are your thoughts in general? Right. Yeah, I know. I think that's a helpful distinction too. There's sort of the evaluation of the particular yeah. claims, and right. I think I would dispute both for different reasons. Um, but then there's sort of the underlying issues in each. So in, the, in that latter one. Um, you know, how comprehensive of a picture are you presenting of the situation? Right. And are you sort of lying by omission right. by um, emphasizing this rather than that? I think that would be the thing to to adjudicate there. Um, uh, and then in the first, um, are you sort of shortcutting the historical work to arrive at a particular moral evaluation of a character? Uh, or is that just a kind of a stand-in for all of the work that you've done uh, in order to establish this, and this is kind of the bow you tie at the end, and you say, "Well, so and so was the hero or the villain of the situation." Right. Um, and if there's slippage, that that too presents a certain issue. So you know whether it's partiality or um, whether it's um, uh, that, then uh, yeah, again, there's a difference between how I would respond to the particular claims and yeah. how I would mm-hmm. deal with kind of the methodological issues there. Sure. Um, so zoom out though a little bit. So he spends, I think the first number of minutes talking about his study of, of the Jonestown yeah. um, deal, which I, I thought was interesting. Um, and in that one, it, it, I, I don't, I didn't think that he was downplaying the evil of the cult and the mass suicide mm-hmm. and all the rest of it, but was also j- j- sort of explaining how he was, he was trying to understand how, how, like, what they were thinking how, yeah how, how yeah. do people get to this point where they mm-hmm. like they believe in this so much and they, and they come to this point where they are absolutely convinced that this is the only way which is a, a seems like a reasonable historical question um and so it was sort of in that context that mm-hmm. then then when they as they lead into the to the world war ii discussion that i'm thinking I, i'm sort of i was inclined to sort of give them a benefit of the doubt like okay it's not like it's not like he was defending this suicide cult and and saying that was somehow okay or good. Um, he he seemed to have a reasonable moral compass, um, w- regardless of whether all the details were exactly correct. Um, but um, I- I'm curious about your take on sort of again sort of zoom out and what did you see? What did you pick up on? And maybe it's particularly a question about his methodology. I mean, mm-hmm. were, or or were there red flags when he was talking about Jonestown that was like, wait a second, where's this guy going? Well, I, I mean, all things being equal, you want to be able to understand the situation that you're dealing with. And and part of that is the perspective of particular historical actors or groups. Right. Um, so if if you just think, well, the only way I can explain this is pure insanity, that, that may well turn out to be the answer, mm-hmm. uh, but you should get there honestly rather than just sort of assuming that from from the get-go. There's, there's work to be done there. Um, how the story as a whole is framed is important. I, I think this is partly what what he's intentionally doing and partly what causes i think some of the backlash there is connecting it to the the history of civil rights right that that's right. what turns out i think to be objectionable to to some of uh those that were pushing back on him um but the the issue of how you start and end the story is a fundamental problem for doing history where, where does this thing begin um how do i get sight of it all at once um you know am i looking at kind of one natural thing, one animal, or have I chopped it up into little bits and, I, and I'm kind of looking at this thing that then I put mm. back together uh, that doesn't really represent anything real. Frankenstein. Uh, yeah, I, I've created this this sort of zombie object that now I'm studying historically. Um, so again, whatever the right or wrong answer is on how you would frame uh, Jonestown, um, you have to go through that process with whatever it is that you're studying and, right. and seek out... Um, the the archaeology right the the account of the beginnings of the thing uh, and also understand the telos understand the end of that thing so that you can you can deal with it now then the issue the further complexity is how does that animal kind of run around in its environment and what are the other things it's related to um but so you can kind of complicate this infinitely uh, but at at first blush you need to really be looking at something rather than nothing you know so um I think to me the the heart of um I think this conversation and what and kind of I guess our current you know kind of Twitter wars over history um 
Mm-hmm. And I, I'm not on Twitter, so I don't even know about some of these yeah. things. Yeah. So. <laughs> Hmm. You're, you aren't missing out. This is going to be great. You aren't missing out. This is going to be yeah. great. This is yeah. great. We can ask him anything, and he doesn't <laughs> yeah, he know the yeah. content. <laughs> you will be after today. You will be. You know, um, my identity is not wrapped up in if we went on to the moon or not, and if I found out that to be true or not, you know, or not true. So if we didn't land on the moon, I'm not, like, shook up. Um, and part of it is just because I'm a Christian, so what I want is is true history. I want the truth about history. Um, and, and so, um, I'm not, you know, I think, I think some of the fallout from this conversation, a lot of people are freaking out and be like, oh my goodness, no, Churchill was the hero and that's all they could see. And they, they couldn't even, they wouldn't even, you know, I would, wouldn't even see people recognizing maybe Churchill had some blemishes or whatever. Um, and so, and I'd say related to that. So, um, I want the truth. And if if I discover something about history that is real, factual, and true, and I need to change what I thought about, you know, the Civil War or whatever, um, then then I'll make that adjustment happily. It doesn't affect me. The other thing is, is I think there's a power play that's going on in this conversation with history, because um, if if history went a certain well you, you see that in DEI you see that how slavery is used with us today it's it's a it's a constant guilt tripping you know bat largely um but also um you know our a good example of this is our scientists in America were pen pals with Nazi Germany scientists and that's how the Kinsey Institute basically birthed mm-hmm. but you know so we were but but if you vilify Hitler so bad then what you did here in America it, it kind of gets covered up or it's not, it's not talked about or it's not a big deal or, you know, just, but so I think history is kind of being used as like a, a like a political weapon in all this. And um, I, I don't, I, I don't think, I, I don't does, think does, does, I see making sense of what I'm trying to say here. Oh yeah. No. Yeah. Um, yeah just like 2D chess. Everyone, everyone understands. <laughs> and and yeah, maybe I can set this up as a question. Yeah. Um, but the, uh, but I, I think, I think history is um, inevitably, um, a, a weapon. I think it's inevitably um, something that dr- it drives people's identity and sense of who they are, what they're for, and what we're aiming at. And, and especially if you believe it's God's story, right? And so, yeah, so, so right. I'm, I'm going to say for good or for yeah, evil, because right. because God wants right. us to know our history. I mean, the, the mm-hmm. you know the the command of Deuteronomy is remember, 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 and right. God is constantly wanting us to. Um, to remember, to tell mm-hmm. the story again of what has happened. And then that is supposed to go down through history. I mean, Christians are the ones that, you know, kind of invented the calendar and, you know, invented um, telling the time from um, uh, from the birth of Jesus and and like telling the story of, of, uh-huh. the, of the reign of Christ. Right. Because we want to remember what, what God has been doing in history so that we know that because we know that we're God's people. We know that we're made in his image. We're redeemed. We're made for a particular purpose. History's and, and going we want somewhere. every need to bow every right. time to confess. Exactly. Yeah. And so, uh-huh. so I think, I think there's a, so there's um, true telling of history is, is in a sense, a weapon against um, unbe- lies, unbelief, unbelief and lies. Yeah. I mean, the uh-huh. truth is, is always opposed yeah. to lies. And so um, a true telling is, is at war with um, the, the lies and the propaganda of, of, of yeah. ultimately of Satan, That's right. of of the, of, of uh, evil, and, and on the other hand, um, those who are not Christians, those who do not care about the truth, um, they're going to want to retell the story, and they want to tell the story to- the story according to their purposes, right. um, in order to fight against the truth, in order to fight against the light, and they want to reinvent a, a story of you know where how we got here, why we're here, and what the meaning of life is. So I think I think that's inevitable, yeah. inescapable yeah. Um, s- story. And history, in mm-hmm. particular, um, always forms sort of the the backdrop for your understanding of who you are and what you're for. Yeah. Um, and, and so, I mean, I, I guess I wonder, um, maybe zooming in on the sort of World War II story, I mean, a, a good bit of what they end up talking about was um, sort of this kind of uh, um, World War II forms a little bit of a of part of our founding myth. Myth, you know, they kind of use that that language, yeah. a, a founding um, story. And and I, um, you know, obviously we've got. Um, We've got the war for independence, the beginning of our country, you know, colonization and the American Revolution. Um, the Civil War, obviously, is another significant part of our our founding mythos, our our, our founding um, story, history. Um, and then I think World War II definitely figures in it you know, very, very significantly. Many of us, you know, my, my grandfather fought in World War II. So we have family members. It's very personal too. Um, mm-hmm. 
how do you see um, maybe the um, the story of World War II as forming that narrative? And then maybe getting to Gabe's question though is like, and then um, why why do these certain pieces rattle so loud, or why are they so threatening to that consensus or that story? Yeah, I think first just to note that it's not like these things just come up from nowhere. The scheme of understanding of American history based on a certain particular set of events as being pivotal. Uh, there's a logic to it. There's reasons why uh, people use those and uh, even across ideological uh, an ideological mm-hmm. spectrum. Yep. At the same time, though, those are historical choices being made to say, well, American history starts with the War of Independence. It's halfway over with the Civil War. And uh, we sort of ride off into the sunset after World War II. Yeah. Uh, those are the markers are real. The, those the the past is real, and yet that that narrative, that structure, that structure to the way that that's told, uh, could be contested in all sorts of ways, right. right? And and baked into it maybe are things that are more or less well understood by the people that use those things. So that that would be kind of my first cut. So yeah, then to take the Second World War in particular well, what do you think American history is all about? That's going to that's gonna determine what it is that you think is the meaning of the war, um, even granting all sorts of shared facts that, that you know, you wouldn't dispute with, with others that, um, you know, fundamentally don't agree with, with you or something like that. But, um, you know, if you think America is a Christian country, well, then World War II means something downstream of that. If you think uh, it's just uh, a... The this nice model of uh, um, classical liberalism. Well, then the war, the, the war means something uh, else. Um, yeah, so I, I don't want to kind of stay only uh, way up in the air, but that that would be that would be kind of so, my first response. Um, go go between those two things. So you just you just gave two, and you you said so. If yeah. this is a uh, an illustration of the the virtue or the goodness of classical liberalism, you mm-hmm. think one thing, or if you think America is a Christian nation, you might think another thing. So spell that out. What, what would that look like then? I mean, and and recognizing here, I mean, just a sketch. Yeah. You're just sketching it. But like, what do you think those differences would mean, cash value? Well, so is the war the, is it the undoing of America's Christian character? Is it, uh, it's preserved in a certain moment and then that is understood to be what it means to be a Christian country, you know, this kind of vague cultural Christianity or something like that. Um, so so I, would, I I don't know if I would, give you a straight answer which maybe is already this apparent. is this is but, this is what academics do yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> i'm normally i'm the one in you know, putting others in the hot seat and just being completely withholding yeah. about give me the reference give me the fact <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah um so you know i don't submit to interrogation i guess very often <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> is is um so, so i mean I'm, I'm curious like what what is your take though on i mean your own yeah. personal take um on um, the war and the legacy of the war. I'm not sure I even have uh, a well formulated thought on that. So I, uh, yeah. Okay. Do you, um, what, what about um, any of the particular things that, um, that uh, Daryl Cooper mentioned? I mean, I, I mean, you, I mean, if somebody says, all right, you're a historian, what's your evaluation of Churchill? Uh, I think where I would start uh, is to look at Churchill uh, not just as a an a-, a political actor uh, himself, but as an historian. So Churchill yeah. spends a lot of his time writing, um, writes what uh, he understands, at least uh, in in certain terms, to be a comprehensive history of what he calls the Thirty Years' War, uh, both both World Wars. Mm-hmm. Um, he has mm-hmm. obviously lots of other historical writing on um, uh, the history of English speaking peoples on the one side, and then also dealing with the the rise of the Cold War on the other. Um, so I think in order to understand him, understanding how he's approaching the history of his own times is is the essential thing. So you know you go to the first book in each of that each of those sets, uh, the World Crisis for World War One, the Gathering Storm for World War Two. Um, what is he talking about in his introduction? He's saying, well, you know, I had this particular role, uh, I had access to this kind of information, and I'm going to try to tell the story uh, sort of in real time so that you, the reader are able to evaluate the, the decisions, the opinions that, that people have, uh, because uh, there's a certain, basically, um, a, a real judgment about the case arises from dealing with the facts as they appeared at the time. Now, there's also a benefit to a kind of post-mortem study of these things, and sure. it turns out this, that, or the other thing were really true. But 
uh, it's easy to be uh, too quick or to be lazy or all sorts of other things in your evaluation when you say, well, but I wouldn't have done that, right? Because right. I know how it turned out, right? Right. And and, and so um, that that's my that's my starting point for basically uh, anything is to right. yeah, see what did, they say about themselves. But and I think Churchill frames the conflict in the way that he does, and it's at least plausible. It's at least worth engaging with. Here's how he sees uh, kind of the passing away of a particular um, uh, nation state system in Europe. He's making it himself a historical analogy to the Thirty Years' War. And so what you know what does that mean? How does what is he reading back into this situation? Um, I think there's plenty there to chew on before you start worrying about, okay, but what's the answer? Do I like him? Am I supposed to? Yeah, is he's a good guy or a bad guy? But, but do you think that he's Thanos? <laughs> is he the villain no. in the story <laughs> no so i i guess to cut cut to it um uh, i churchill himself is the one that talks about world war ii as the unnecessary war he tells he talks about this in the beginning of the gathering storm he says uh you know i, I think it's he kind of gives an anecdote about fdr or someone saying um you know what should we what should we call this and churchill's own suggestion is the unnecessary war now mm -hmm. what does he mean by that that's the question i think um the 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 idea that somehow uh, it never needed to happen, and Churchill was the one that, that instigated it. It at least doesn't comport with what he says about it, which is, sure, it never needed to happen, and here are all the reasons why it nevertheless did um, on both sides or sort of on all sides. You know, he goes through more minutely uh, not only the domestic political situation uh, in Britain, but also the, you know, conflict among the world powers in Europe, you know, what is Russia doing? What's Germany doing? All these other things. And then all of those things in their own historical context. So um, again, I think that's a lot of material to chew on before you worry about kind of anything else. But maybe this is the prerogative of being a professor is that I <laughs> <laughs> can do that for a while. Um, but but I also recognize and, and to, you know, push back on that tendency uh, to end up in the kind of endless conversation about things is not helpful either. And and that's something that really needs to be avoided, especially because that tends to downplay the the practical um, outcomes of having a particular account of, of history. Yeah, you mean you have, you have to land somewhere at some point because you have to, I mean, and, and not that we uh, can know everything about all, I mean, there's some areas of history where you're just like, we don't know, maybe we'll figure it out at some point, but we don't know. And, and that's, that's God's prerogative to allow us to have um, information that we, that we need. Um, but I think something like um, the life of Churchill and World War II is something where there, we actually have access to a lot of information. And so I think there's sort yep. of, there's a natural instinct to say, but okay, so who, who are the good guys? Who are the bad guys? And what did we learn? Um, if you're, if you're uh if your five-year-old son asks, you know, would <laughs> ask you, you know, so dad, who's the good guys? Who are the bad guys? What do you say? Churchill's the good guy. Yeah, he's the yeah, good guy. I, okay. I, I think at that level, it's not hard. Yeah. Um, but what gets there, difficult as you so get older, though. What, but why? So I think I think that there's more to be said about it. Yeah, and, absolutely. And the reason why you've come to that conclusion, the extent to which there's uh, there's some conversation still to be had, some debate about even that thing to be had. Um, I think that's what emerges as you get older. You, you take it more seriously and you may have kind of more or less opportunity to work on this. So again, you, yeah. you go to college and you take a history course right. for a year. Well, that gives you the opportunity to think historically for a good long time with others, knowing that I'm going to kind of weaponize this once I graduate and go out, but also knowing, well, there's just, there's just a, uh, something nice about being able to work on this for a little while, uh, especially again, knowing that it has kind of an end date to it. It's not just this endless thing. I, I, I'm going to go back to something Gabe said though. I mean, I, I think you're, you're right, but like, I think the Bible really is actually very helpful in this because yeah. God is constantly telling us, you know, we have this inspired story. He's training us how and to read and, history. And, yeah. and, he, and, he, and it's, and it, and it t tells us all of those things. So like you have, you know, I mean, Abraham is a hero. He's the father of all the faithful. Is he perfect? No. Um, um, you know, he, he, I think you can ask the same question. Uh, Are, um, was David the hero? Right, no, of the story, that's what right? I mean. But yeah. like, like, I was going to go through the whole Bible. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm, Let I'm, me finish. <laughs> Two D chess, bro. Two D chess. Two D chess. <laughs> this it's is a three D. It's a three D. No, but I'm like I'm just walking through. Like, I mean, Samson. Samson yeah. is a good guy, according to Hebrews eleven. Yeah, he's one of the Great. heroes of the faith. Yeah, it, very flawed man, but mm -hmm. good guy. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, David, mm -hmm. good guy. 
very flawed, uh, mm -hmm. a man after God's own heart. So, so like, it's it's perfectly fine then to tell your five-year-old son, hey, mm -hmm. is that a good guy or a bad guy, dad? Good yes. guy. Mm -hmm. And right. in the back of your mind, like, with some major flaws, yeah. you, you know, and, and, and- We'll explain some things later. And, and as you're reading yeah. through the Bible, though, that's that's part of the lesson. And, and you go through the kings. I mean, I'm thinking of like all the kings were like, yeah. and some of them are like, you know, he wasn't as bad as the last guy. Right. He still didn't remove the high places. And sometimes he's still, you know, there were still some pagan altars, uh, but, you know, uh, but he was, you know, he was pleasing God. You know, God, God was okay with him. Yeah. You know, and other other kings are righteous, and they yeah. and they tore down the high places and reestablished godly worship. And it's like, oh wow. So what I would say is, uh, I think the tendency to go too quickly to the evaluation side is like thinking that scripture could be replaced with the Wikipedia list of yeah. Here's the king. Good bad. Good, here's bad. the evaluation. Yeah. Did they take down the high places or not? And then. I just learned that list and I've extracted it from the historical yeah. narrative. I no longer need to do any work. I don't need to think about it because I because I've got the the answer. Right. Um it yeah. And, and maybe to some extent, I mean, some of the reactions to Daryl Cooper and Tucker's conversation is is the sort of concerns though that like is 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 he, whether intentional or not, short circuiting some of that evaluation, like you know, chief villain. You know, maybe with a smirk on his, you know, you know, tug in cheek, maybe not entirely seriously, but like, but is that, I mean, are people going to go and do the work or are they going to just use that as their Wikipedia cheat page? And that's not necessarily a question. That's I, just, I'm just, yeah. I mean, I think the different, uh, different people, different demographics may respond differently, right? So the, the folks that that's supposed to anger or annoy are going to have a certain reaction. Uh, those that, uh, it gives maybe a little too much comfort are going to have a certain reaction. And then you've got to deal with the consequences of that. So maybe that's thinking that uh, of that as part of what we're doing with history is important that the effect that the particular narrative has on students, yeah. by which I just mean yeah. anyone who's yeah. receiving this right. or, or engaged in this, that that's an ongoing responsibility of the historian or, or, or whoever it is that that's engaged in this to to kind of continue that. So yeah. there, there's maybe a, a version of that that is uh, in the sort of pastoral role, right? When you're, you're preaching about David, you have this, this again, ongoing responsibility to um, to not leave someone in a bad spot, right? Um, yeah. And, and they they themselves have a responsibility for themselves. But there's, there's uh, at least in some of these situations, there's kind of a mutual... Yeah. Um, some of this, Some of this bothers me, though, because okay. it... It acts as if you don't see the stakes that are actually in front of us currently to think like that. As if like the high stakes. Yes. Like, Cause everybody, we got election that's coming up in you know the next month or so. Mm -hmm. And um, and everybody is trying to figure out if what they have been told about their history is so much a lie that it's manipulating them into a version that is destroying the very country that they live in via Haitians and all the stuff that's going on, immigration. So if or, or is Trump or, or, Trump or that's the, the other area is going or is Trump actually Hitler and he's serving a group of people who feel like that they've lost their country because of other folks. And so I don't have that luxury in one sense mm -hmm. to ponder some of this. And there's guys out there that are doing some some good shorthand work and some who are not that are helping people come to an idea of wait a second. Um, I need to figure out based off the history which because you use history to tell you what's the direction you need to be going that is actually good and the direction you need to avoid because it was bad because it didn't work out so well but if if you don't have any handles on that in this moment how do you even operate really well for the future i, th I think that's fair um what i would say is that's why whatever historical period you're studying you're studying it as something of immediate significance uh, you know, when I'm teaching Herodotus or Thucydides, the idea isn't, well, these are some interesting things. I'll write them down somewhere yeah. and maybe I'll remember them for Jeopardy in five or 10 years. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If I ever end up on Jeopardy, um, the idea is you have to grapple with them with the same kind of seriousness with which you grapple with contemporary issues because they're contemporary issues. Now, now there's of course th elements of that that are just sort of nice features of being able to take a college course. Fine. Um, at the same time, though, um, it's all of this free experience that is otherwise pretty hard to get somewhere um, for, you know, how people interact with each other, uh, how things tend to go, what happens when this uh, 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 comes alongside this other thing, right? So, um, yes, certainly if you don't have any urgency 
um, whether you're studying World War II or whether you're studying the Peloponnesian War, that's a big problem. But I would say that's, that is therefore something to emphasize greatly when you're working through that kind of material. Because now there, there's, there's other hours in the day, and so you can, you can watch the news and, and try to interpret it as well and try to see these things there too. Um, but Nobody trusts them. But there's all this. <laughs> well, right, right. You don't have to because you're not receiving, just like you're not just kind of passively receiving historical data about other time periods. You're not passively mm -hmm. receiving historical data about what's happening right now. You're you're learning, you know, how to how to deal with the different perspectives. You're learning what's reliable or not. You're learning how to weigh different kinds of evidence, you know, what people say versus what they do, you know, whatever whatever it is. Um yeah, I I would just say I I think studying history with urgency can happen whether you're dealing with you know the the last couple of years or 2000 years ago that is very unsatisfying <laughs> i've heard that from <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry to repeat this I, I guess cuz they they're um you know if i guess i'm thinking about it like this let's say that uh the christian historical um idea I'm going to, I'm going to fight it. I'm somebody who's a charismatic. I'm going to go out and do evangelizing. And so what I go and do is I grab my anointing oil. I grab uh, <laughs> my handkerchiefs and I grab, you know, some hyssop and I go out in the streets and I start speaking in tongues and throwing oil on people and casting out demons and doing all kinds of stuff. And you guys are very happy that I'm out there, but you wish that I understood <laughs> what was going on and what happened and not operating in a form of ignorance. Right. And I'm, I'm like, where is, how do we, cause that's what, I think that's where people are at, where they're going to go out, they're going to do something. And if you don't have a, if you don't trust any of your historical teaching, then you don't really know. And I think that's important. I think they're jamming you. You don't really know what to do on the next move. And it's like, it doesn't feel satisfying to be like, well, you gotta, you gotta speed up your, your process or you, you have to go through the process. It's like, does somebody have like, for instance, what would be a great source that you would recommend for somebody to kind of get some handles around this? Uh, at least the topic of World War II, um, Churchill, was Germany the good guys? <laughs> well, again, I would just say read material from the time so that you are the one that is working through it and not just letting other people do all the work for you. Now, I, I understand the point that you can't do this all the time with everything, always. Fine. But that, but any of these, th any of these topics would work, right? And it's a lot less dangerous to give a stupid reading of Thucydides than it is to give a stupid reading of you know what happened today, mm. right? So, mm. so yeah, I, not everyone is called to study every certain or, or even any particular um, period, but I think approached in the right way and and dealt with in an urgent way, um, it, it I think it does answer the the. Um, dissatisfaction that you're feeling about um you know well okay what what am i doing now with this mm. gabe you're gonna ask a question oh i mean just kind of I more thoughts like, that might like, turn into a question more 2d chess um you know i think uh, you know this goes back to you know i want to insist in in the in the kind of i guess philo philosophical view of history that we really get God's history in our brains first, you know, the Bible in our brains first, because if we just kind of go with a blank slate mm -hmm. to, you know, um, the Civil War or to, you know, um, Churchill, uh, we we don't we are we we don't know how God's historical figures function and how his characters interact in history. And then and then to you know even the basic question to your five year old, well, what is a good guy? You know, what 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 is a bad guy? And how can you say Churchill's a good guy? You know, by what standard are are we getting at in this? And that's uh, that was the biggest thing I saw lacking in that interview was okay, why don't you discuss what God's stories are first, and then maybe we can back our way into no. maybe understanding he, you know, Churchill. I felt like I was just in this conversation, watching this conversation happen, and it was just kind of like in this in this glass, you know. Um, you know, office and watching it happen with 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 not well and, and, and real some, understanding of God's character and His Word. Yeah, and I and and somebody, I, I mean, I I I had tweeted out that like I appreciated the conversation. And, yeah, and and, and uh, yeah. I did too. And, and I was, um, 
I wasn't satisfied with everything and I, and I didn't even, I don't, nec- I don't necessarily agree with everything, but it, I just thought it was an interesting conversation. I appreciated the conversation. Um, but in some of the pushbacks, people actually screenshotted a couple of uh, Daryl Cooper's previous tweets. And like one of them, he actually, uh, he actually said at some point that he, he thinks that, um, uh, that the God of the old Testament is the most bloodthirsty God, um, mm-hmm. more, yeah. more bloodthirsty than all of the pagan gods. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, Oh, well maybe he's, not quite as good at identifying villains as yeah you know i mean right, I, right. I mean and i hope i mean if i get a chance to talk to him and meet him at some point i'd want to ask yeah. him about that i want to i want to, I want to address yeah. that because yeah. that, that's by what standard question. Yeah, that's yeah that's yeah. problematic and um and is you know is playing into whether i'm thinking you know how how trustworthy is this historian because he's reading the old testament in a in a relatively in a pretty biased way goes at the gabe's point yeah i mean do, do you know I've, i mean i don't know if you have um uh, other, um, e- either from the interview or other interactions with him, but like, I mean, how, how do you evaluate that? I, I would say there's a reason why the class that I'm teaching happens within the context of the curriculum at NSA, right? So mm. we're, we're approaching the material, even if we are starting with a pagan like Herodotus, we're approaching it from within a Christian context. And, yeah. I, and I try to read through as many Christian historians as we can too, um, to kind of see that play out in another form. But but I think there's a difference between uh, studying these things ensconced uh, in biblical perspective yeah. uh, and doing it as kind of a one-off thing out in the ether, which is maybe an overstatement of what uh, sure. what Cooper's doing. But um, and, I, and I, I've heard that Cooper is apparently a professing Christian, so so there's some you know um, tensions there. Mm. And so I, I you know again I would appreciate the opportunity to meet him and talk to him about it more. But but yeah, I mean somebody who is who's taking um uh, who begins with scripture as as sort of the first historical text the first historical record and then is learning history from that um that's going to really affect and impact uh, and it's been you know especially with uh and a doctrine of inspiration and things yeah. like that it's it's, it's going to hugely impact how then you get to history yeah but by contrast i think this was i don't know if it was a facebook ad, ad or something for like a great courses course on uh like biblical history something like that and the the tagline was something to the effect well the bible's not a history book um but we can sort of do history about biblical stuff and isn't that better you know that, that's kind of the implication and right that that i think is the real kind of opposite right where you you could even study the things that happen in scripture um and miss the whole point right uh because you that's because right. you're yeah. it's not it's mm. not sort of like well if i study the ancient near east that makes me biblical right right uh, if i study the hellenistic and roman world that makes me biblical right, right. no uh mm. you, you can study whatever you're going to study but the the environment and the starting point is 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 christian well, is biblical is scriptural we, we should have had some videos of this where because there's examples on the modern church where they're taking you know samson to be the bad guy the churches yeah. pastors right you know david was a rapist right mm-hmm. you know right samson right yeah and, and rachel denhollander yeah, right. That, that's exactly. So, yeah, that's so, SBC. Yeah, and so you actually have like these crazy modern takes of the history takes of the right. Bible. Right, and and the issue is back to your point, Gabe. By what standard? Yeah, and so not only is Scripture this inspired, it actually is inspired history, mm-hmm. but it's actually the standard for like that's for judging all of the history. Yeah, that's yeah. Like, yeah that, it's, that's it's the, not just specifically yeah. authoritative about how I judge this or that person but it's broadly authoritative in the principles that i'm yeah, deriving in, from. in h- historiography is that, is that yeah. the right word you used it earlier yeah <laughs> but like it, it's it's the inspired perfect example like this is how you do history and this is how you evaluate historical characters but it mm. but so it is your standard but but um somebody who comes in and says um the god of the old testament is the most bloodthirsty violent god well okay clearly the bible's not the standard for evaluating how you evaluate coming to that conclusion mm-hmm. there's another standard at work here that standard if it's not scripture then it's it's some it's some human standard it's some created standard of right and wrong and morality but it's not god's standard because god's standard is found in scripture and now you're taking that standard and now you're going to evaluate churchill you're going to evaluate you know world war ii the mm-hmm. nazis mm-hmm. modern american history or or whatever or the old testament mm-hmm. um but that, but you've, you've, um, there's an implied standard there, and the standard is clearly not the word of God. Um, I, so, 
I, I feel like we, we should just try to pin Dr. Doyne down just a little bit more. I mean, like, he's loving it. I think, yeah. I think he's warming up. And yeah, I, think, yeah. I think we, we just like, just get, she's we got about another hour, right? Yeah. I think in an yeah, hour, yeah, you got be, time. Be, be, all right, let me go. Let me go. What do I got to <laughs> say? What do I got to say? Um, no, um, um, so you were asking though about like, okay, so we're, we're like the immediate needs of our moment. I think that's one of the reasons why this is so flammable mm -hmm. is because I think there is a, a, a sort of what has come to be called sort of this post World War II consensus um, that I think broadly can be described as um, in order to avoid the horrors of the Holocaust, um, uh, we need to strongly downplay nationalism. We need to strongly downplay um, uh, um, family ties. Um, we need to strongly downplay um, masculine culture. Masculine culture. Um, I think even like religious distinctives. Yes. I mean, I mean, things like that and, and sort of this, um, what I, I've sort of described as sort of a multicultural gospel. The, the multicultural gospel is, you know, uh, basically that if we, um, if we mix a lot of different cultures together, um, often intentionally with lots of different religions and lots of different, and, and, we, and then, then basically people be, will realize we're all human after all. And some, and then utopia will break out, you know, something, something like that with, with, you know, sort of a democracy, you know, sprinkled over the top, the, the goodness of, of human humanity will sort of just, you know, um, bubble up. Mm -hmm. Um, and so this, and it's this, it's, it's humanistic multicultural thing with, you know, you can sprinkle God on top and, you know, vague things that, you know, Democrats and Republicans, you know, can just say, but, um, but that's been, you know, a growing, you know, Eisenhower famously said, you know, I don't care what God you believe in just so long as you believe in God. And, you know, that's, that's apparently the God that got put on our money was, you know, just this generic, mm -hmm. you know, not communist God, apparently. Um, and, and that, but of course it's, um, it, it, and in this moment though, a whole bunch like that, like that's coming to uh, fruition mm -hmm. and you have, you know, um, you know, this, uh, it, mass immigration in, in, in Western Europe, Britain, uh, crime statistics. I saw an article, um, this morning that, um, said that, um, it, it's like the, the statistics of, um, there are now more, I think it's now more imprisoned. I don't know if it's people or if it was young men, there are now more imprisoned, um, young people or young men in Spain than are not in prison. Mm. And, and then if you look at the statistics of how many of them are, are I immigrants, or children of immigrants, it skyrockets, mm. and and so that's happening. Um, there's and then there's there's sort of a backlash to that going on, and people um, saying, "Wait a second, maybe you know we, we have the immigrants pouring over the border, um, and and the culture clashes that are being created." It, it, you know, turns out it's you can't just mix a bunch of cultures together and peace breaks out. Um, turns out we have this thing called sin. Um, you know, there's this other problem that you can't it, 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 peace doesn't just break out. Um, so I'm I'm curious. I mean, do you um um what do you think of um given sort of that narrative or at least that broad consensus? Um, uh, um I think that's part of the reason why people are kind of getting red pilled in a, in a sense. Where, where oh, they're, where, where, absolutely. Where, where they're saying, no, you you stole my identity. You're trying to steal my identity. You're trying to crush heritage. Me. And and, yeah. and and then you have. And then I think really um, a decent chance of an overreaction then to people who are already or are now saying, no, I, you know, I, I'm going to be all, all about my whiteness or all about my blackness, or I'm, you know, I'm, I gotta, I gotta find my identity in blood and soil. And, and, ah, um, you know, you, you get to have a microphone and you say, okay, here's the deal. What do you say? <laughs> I think, um, Obviously, there's a danger that in the reaction to those things, you end up with something just as flat and unthoughtful. Um, that's not the end of it. That's not the only thing to be said about it. But you, you have to be careful that you've not just replaced. You've not just, well, I, I, here's a lie. Uh, I, I've been, the, the truth of things has been covered up by this, uh, this veneer. Um, and now that it's been pulled off, I see things as they really are. Right. I mean, no, you don't. Right. Now you have to figure out what's going on. Mm. Right. Um, mm. And there's an element of that that's personal responsibility, but also that's wedded to all sorts of other things that you're, uh, the, there's a kind of community or cultural element to it too. So part of the response or the way of dealing with, I think, kind of individuals that um, essentially go off the rails in response to things like this is that 
you want to you want to be rooted in Christian community, um, uh, in the church, in schools. Uh, you know, th- those are the places to to work through those things, um, and you don't want to just kind of arbitrarily cut yourself off from the world and say, "Well, I'm going to drill down and I'm going I am going to understand what was really happening." In World War II, uh, by just you know reading a bunch of books myself and talking with myself, uh, <laughs> there's um, mm. like I was saying before, there's sort of the obligation to continue these things, especially when you're in some kind of uh, role of authority. Um, but but again, the, the individual has the responsibility to to be a participant and not just you know I, I myself will solve all of these problems. Right. Yeah. So so the necessity of of um, community. That's, that's a really striking thing because you're right. Yeah. There, there, so there's, there are assumptions built into how you think about arriving at the truth, H- how you think you're going to get at the truth. Are you thinking primarily in terms of autonomy that I, by myself, mm-hmm. will read a bunch of books, listen to a bunch of podcasts, follow all these guys on X, and then you're going to arrive at the truth? Or um, has God established um, a people that is not always right about mm-hmm. everything, but but where his Holy Spirit is, where his word is, where people mm-hmm. gather for worship, where in the in the in the context of being faithful to your wife, being faithful mm-hmm. to your husband, yeah. loving your kids, being faithful to that story that God's given yeah, you. I mean, yeah. so and, and being faithful in worship, being That's faithful right. in confessing your sin and forgiving one another and practicing hospitality and caring for the poor in your community. And, it, and so in that context, like or is that work the truth? Is. is is that is that where God um, ordinarily is revealing the truth? Um, that's a that's a really um, yeah, that's stood up. I, I, it's actually a, a really important point to make because I think especially when you've been betrayed by a lot of people, you know maybe as your parents, maybe yeah. your dad left you when you were a kid, mm-hmm. um, may, maybe your mom left, maybe you went to you know maybe you got ripped off with a public education, you yeah. or, or you went to a university and they gave you a bunch of yeah. nonsense. Mm-hmm. Um, the media lies to you all day long, and then you're tempted to not be- to to like just hate people, mm-hmm. and then you know get bitter about it, your it, your history. Except, or whatever. You know, yeah. except for the three podcasts, you know, you, you know that you listen to all the time. But this disembodied thing, where it's mm-hmm. not it's yeah. not actually community. It's just this voice in your head, and you're and it's just yeah. making you mad. Yeah. And um and w- more worked up and more radicalized. But you're not. It, it's like there's assumptions going into um is is where where is God um. Um, how has God made the world such that we arrive at truth? I, that, I think it's a really good point. That's actually really helpful. One of the things that's happening through all of this is that— You're not as frustrated as you were a little bit. Oh, no, ago. I'm still frustrated. <laughs> but that like was that was like cream. That okay, was fantastic. That. That was fantastic. <laughs> no, that was, I think that was great. No, seriously, because part of what's happening is to make you lose trust in institutions, and it just so happens that institutions is the way in which God designed to bless his people. That's right. that, yeah. That and so when you so yeah. the, the intent is to get you away from that, to get you siloed. Like that narcissism yeah. works that yeah. way too, right? It's me by myself in this little area. Yeah, I got this secret. And knowledge. I got this secret yeah. knowledge, and nobody else has. And you just blew the top off of it with that. Is like, look, you need to work these things out within the context of your church, primarily, right? And then you got families, and then you do have civil magistrates and these other things. But well, and, you don't and, leave those in order to find what you're looking for. That's really good. Uh, uh, were you going to say something? I was just going to say, and not just with your church, but also your relationship with God, your story yes. that God's yeah. given you. It's true. Like, you, yeah. you have to work that out, you know, yeah. which includes yeah. repentance. Well, that's what that. I mean. That's what you're working oh, so, out. Right. Yeah. 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 I was thinking this. Um, uh, so w- when I when I sent out my tweet after I, I listened to the show, I, I, I said I said this. I said, I appreciate the show. And I, I just said the era of the experts is crumbling. Yeah. There's a place for true expertise, mm-hmm. but the current elites have failed us. Media, yeah. media medicine religion so historians must rebuild trust also and um i think some people maybe write into more than i was actually saying i wasn't saying there's no place for institutions there's not a place for actual expertise right i said that you know there is a place for true expertise and real expertise builds real institutions that's right but but i do think we live in a moment where a whole lot of people blew their credibility in really big ways and so the temptation is to go gnostic Reject yeah. all institutions, reject all community, and reject go, all authority. All, and all authority, <laughs> yeah. which yeah. I'm not, I'm not in favor of it. But I'm just yeah. saying it is true that um, we are. It, it's this, uh, and this part of this is the social media moment, and everybody's got a phone, and everybody's got a you know a camera, and you know it's sort of like yeah. like media has been radically democratized. If you got a yeah. phone, you know you're yeah. you're a journalist. Now, you can upvote it. Yeah. You may be a yeah. terrible journalist, but you know you it's, it's it's possible. And then you can have a, a, a podcast 
that can um, be, you know, a nobody who really does actually break something really profound, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. or you can have wackos and 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 complete nut jobs. Um, but uh, we're in a moment where we have to rebuild community, which means we have to rebuild trust, which means we have to rebuild the credibility of these of of experts. Yeah. You, you looked like you were going to say something a minute ago. Yeah, the the issue isn't you know sort of knowing a lot about something, right? If that's all that an expert is, fine. Um, but but it's the it's expertise itself getting kind of cordoned off from everything else, and then deciding that it has autocratic power over right. everyone yeah, else. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but enough, rather, about, rather, enough about Fauci. <laughs> <laughs> rather than having a responsibility, and I think that's why kind of the model of teaching is more helpful than than expertise because it's not about it's not even about me kind of transmitting particular information to students it's you know for for a variety of good reasons they've decided to come to nsa and and now they're sophomores and they're taking this course yeah uh, and i have a responsibility to them not to make them worse and so far as i can uh not to leave them in a bad spot uh, but also not to baby them or or just try to impose my particular yeah. wacky take on something um you know, as as often as I have wacky <laughs> takes on things. <laughs> oh, I've heard. Yeah, I've heard. There, oh, really. Yeah. <laughs> Did we go to the moon? No, you. <laughs> Did we go to the moon? <laughs> well, if it's not in Herodotus, then I don't know. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> you only have wack, wacky uh, takes uh, on Herodotus. Uh, like, uh, is it Psalm time? It, it, yeah. I, I, last thing I was just thinking okay. of, and it ties into all this, is I, I'm I'm working on a short article right now where I was, I was thinking about all this stuff, and and the thing that I'm it occurred to me is that God requires. Um, uh, in his word. He has a pretty high standard for truth, and particularly um, judicially, the presumption of innocence. Um, he requires two or three witnesses, yeah, um, criminally, but also to convict anybody of sin, two or three witnesses. And Jesus reiterates that in Matthew 18, where he says, even if your brother, you think your brother sinned against you, you go and talk to them. But if, but if he doesn't agree, you can bring one or two others with you. And those are not your thugs. <laughs> those are either people who witnessed the event that you're talking about so they can be witnesses that you are right yeah, uh -huh. or they're witnesses potentially just of the disagreement to add a you know a, a third a, party. An objective party yeah. that says actually maybe you're not hearing one another and, and you work yeah. it out with because there's two or three witnesses but i think that adds to and builds on the very same point uh, and, and in matthew 18 is striking that in that context of calling for a couple more witnesses to establish facts of a of a potential conflict just a couple verses down, Jesus says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. And oftentimes we use that quote just to talk about, you know, a nice prayer meeting or whatever, which is, which is, I think <laughs> it, it works there too. But yeah. I also think that it's in the context of, of deciding what is true, yeah. what is just, what is right. And I, and I think we need to be thinking the same way in terms of Christian community. Um, you're not to be on your own. You're not to be autonomous. You're, you're not to be a lone ranger. You're, we're not after this Gnostic spark of some kind of secret revelation. No, God promises to show up and be in the midst of his people when they're gathered together in his name. Right. Um, and so again, that might be your family, and that uh, you know, to, uh, uh, day by day, that might be you know um, your 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 work community, your school community, and the, but of course, at the center of it is the church community, those who gather together in the name of Christ um, in prayer and in worship, and where the keys of the kingdom have been um, given. Uh, but I just think you know we, we are, and in, I was thinking of this even with um, you know evaluating uh, heroes and villains. God, mm -hmm. it's interesting. God requires presumption of innocence in a fallen world. Yeah. Which is, which is really bizarre if you think about right. it. You're like, everybody's guilty. Yeah. <laughs> and God says, no, you have to assume they're innocent unless yeah. you have two or three witnesses to establish that evil. Right, right. And, and I think that's that's a principle that applies to historical work. Mm -hmm. That, you know, it's like, um, that um, don't, don't be, I mean, God requires us to presume innocence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then requires two or three witnesses to establish that someone has done something wrong and something evil. And I think that yeah. applies to our evaluation of, of, uh, of, um, characters in history, which which means murderers could go free. In That's this, right in God's it, it, judicial yeah, world. Yeah, in God's world, it's better that the occasional criminal get off than innocence be convicted because there aren't two or three witnesses. Right. Because, right. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 the same thing goes with right. just nickel dime sins that aren't even crimes. Just you know somebody you know whatever you know said something you thought was offensive or ugly or evil or something like and and but there's like no witnesses and they say I don't know what you're talking about. I was I was you know you're overreacting. Yeah. Well. The Bible requires in that situation that you cover it in love. Yeah. And and you think to yourself, well, maybe I did misread it. Yeah. But it's better for that to happen than for you to chase them down the street. Yeah. Um, and and I think that that's a that's a really 
striking uh, orientation to evaluating uh-huh. what's going on around you right yeah, now right. and evaluating history. Yeah. And um, it takes faith in God. Yeah. Trusting to, that God. Trust, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah, he's he, the ultimate judge. He's yeah. the one that's going to bring all to fruition. Yeah. He, and he's he's the one that's going to help you all to let love cover. He's going to empower yeah, you to actually let yeah. love cover if there's he, he a yeah, I mean, he he is, I mean, it's it, I mean, it, it is cliche as it sounds, it is his story. Yeah. yeah. And he is the one he he is going to he's going to tell it all. Right. And and evaluate it ultimately correctly, and he's the one that's going to wipe away every tear from every mm-hmm. eye. He's the one that's going to make it all right. Um, before I do, Psalm Jordan, any last word on any of this? I I think just uh, repeating that there's urgency on the one hand. You should take this seriously, take historical study seriously, and at the same time, what was just said that that you can rest in God's providence and not worry too much about it. Yeah, mm. yeah. it's good. Amen. All right. Uh, Guys, you listen to Cross Politics because you take the Dominion mandate seriously. Unsurprisingly, so does Dominion Wealth Strategists. They will help you build a multi generational legacy with holistic financial strategies that include budgeting, insurance, debt management, retirement planning, estate planning, and more. Dominion Wealth leverages all corners of the financial services industry as independent brokerage agents matching you with suitable products and services from dozens of top industry service providers. They educate, advise, and build plans to reduce your donation to Caesar and maximize your gift to God. No matter your tax bracket, they have solutions for every fiscal stage of life. And for your children, if you and your spouse want to take dominion over your finances, book a complimentary consultation at reformed.money today from baptism to burial dominion has you covered. Once again, that's reformed.money to book a complimentary consultation. I wish I owned that URL. Reform dot money. Reform dot money. serious. Yeah. We Christians. Reform, <laughs> Reform dot, dot, money. dot money. All right. Cheers. Cheers is a king. It's time for beer and psalms. Cheers. 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 Mm. This is Psalm 12. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth. For the faithful fail from among the children of men. They speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor. With flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue speaketh proud things. Who have said, with our tongue we will prevail. Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. The words of the Lord are pure words, a silver tried in the furnace of earth purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. This is a psalm that cries out for God to help. That's how it starts. Help. Lord. Amen. When so many of the faithful are failing and compromising, when the wicked walk on every side, and when the vilest men are exalted to positions of authority and power, this is a cry for help when everyone is a liar, full of flattery and forked tongues, who boast in the power of their words, their lies, their foul mouths, and they say, who will be Lord over us? We can we can make the world however we want. This psalm answers The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and proud tongues. He's the judge. Those lips and tongues destroy lives. They tear families apart and crush the poor and the needy. And God says he will arise. He will save the poor and needy. He will destroy those who run their mouths with arrogance. And we know this because God's words are pure words. His words are like pure silver, purified seven times. God's word will guard and protect all those who take refuge in him. All who cling to his word will be safe in every generation, even when they sur- they are surrounded by the wicked and the vile. I want to make three brief points. First, this psalm fits our day well with all of our media liars, our political liars, our educational liars, and it's all dressed up in our modern day in the drag of niceness and politeness. Pretty faces, suits and ties, letters after their names, all while crushing the poor and needy. Think of the children being crushed by abortion. Think of the test tube babies being bought and sold like boutique accessories for Mm. experimental families and sodomites. Think of the Mm. children left fatherless and motherless by the lies of their parents, saying they found true love and then breaking their marriage vows and deserting their children. Think of the lies that claim to be helping the poor and needy by creating one more government program, oh no, 10 more, that ultimately raise taxes and then enslave everyone. Second, this psalm should also be allowed to cut the hearts of Christians inside the church. Our lies may be more subtle in some ways, but we have every bit of problem with flattery and lies as the world. All the 
God bless you and God bless your heart and sweetheart and brother sister language in the fellowship hall after church is often a thinly veiled mask of duplicity. How many of the same people are busy gossiping, telling stories, lying on hating their brother or sister by refusing to tell them the truth about their sin, refusing to hold them accountable? How many daughters and wives are allowed to dress like sluts and whores and no one loves them enough to tell them to cover up? How many young men are hungry for respect and tempted to wrath because they're challenging and uncouth and impetuous? And how many just need a good older men to call them to true, hard-hitting wisdom, but no one loves them enough to give them the truth? How many pencil-necked goobers are allowed to pursue pastoral ministry and no one has the love to tell them they're not cut out for it? How many pastors have disqualified themselves by their cowardice and compromise in the pulpit, refusing to preach the straight word of God? How many congregations and elder boards continue to put up with a mealy-mouthed simpering and refuse to require obedience? How many husbands refuse to love their wives by regularly teaching and correcting their wives, like Jesus does the church, washing his bride in the water of the word? Why do we refuse to tell the truth? Because it will cause trouble. Because there will be blowback. You'll be misunderstood. Instead, we flatter and lie, pretending everything is fine. And we wonder why the wicked strut all around us. We are the wicked. We think we're somehow more righteous than our politicians and media hacks, and many churches are frequently filled with just as much flattery and lies. Lastly, this psalm opens with perhaps one of the shortest prayers that is fitting for all of this and basically any situation. Help, Lord. What a wonderful prayer. Help, Lord. We need to bring up something with one of your kids. Help, Lord. When you need to address something with a fellow church member, your spouse, a fellow elder, your neighbor, help, Lord. And when you need to speak up at city council or at presbytery, help, Lord. And before you hit post on Facebook or X or Instagram, Mm -hmm. help, Lord. And for our state, for our nation, for our world, help, Lord. I've said that prayer so many times. Yeah. I think I wake up and be like, help, help Lord. Lord. I, I just wake up, my eyes open, and that's like, what Ooh, help, is. Lord. <laughs> Dr. Jordan, thank that's you so right. much for joining yeah, us. I appreciate you. you. Thank you for taking time out to do it. That was prayer he was praying the whole time. Help, Lord. Help, Lord. Get me out of here. If you're single, get married. If you're married, have you some kids. And if you have kids, go baptize them. Until tomorrow, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Go fight, laugh, and feast. This is Cross Politic. Help, Lord. Wanted. Young men to rebuild Western civilization. Must be unafraid of pain, blisters, intellectual rigor, and a lifetime of long shifts with swords and shovels, digging ditches, repelling invaders, and reading stacks of books taller than their fathers. Must be impervious to manipulative women of all sorts, giggling virgins, cyber skanks, and even full cauldrons of Karens or hand-wringing clergy, but always seeking to hear and heed the words of Lady Wisdom. Immune to the leadership of hypocrites and LARPing online masculinitats, unaffected by abusive authorities, (laughs) petty professors, and all brokers of official respectability, willing to hoist the Jolly Roger and Johnny Cash's favorite finger whenever faced with idolatry. Long-suffering joy and determination required. Must be willing to dwell among the tombs and graves of the long dead. Seeking truths that cannot die. Exhaustion guaranteed. Conflict guaranteed. Mortality guaranteed. New St. Andrews College. Liberal arts for the undaunted.